I keep seeing the same thing. And it's advancement, so we're, I'm ready to go. I won't tell you what the other topics were. Yes, I will. I'll tell you. I was toying between, by wisdom, a house is built and the various applications of wisdom. Then I was thinking something that's kind of been stirred up in our staff meetings is the difference between fathering and mentoring and what does that mean. And so I'm doing that pretty much just with our staff, but it's still fresh. And then, then we ended up uh, the clothing series, three parts, correct? Parts one, two, and three, for those that are following all three. And it ended with something that I think was very significant, that when we're properly clothed, we're reflecting the proper image. And that would be the Genesis face. And I really feel strong about getting into the Genesis face. How many know what I mean by the Genesis face? Just my pastors, okay. Um, the Genesis face is when a man looks at his natural face in a mirror. You know where that's at in James? When a man looks at his natural face as in a mirror, that natural is not fleshly carnal. That natural is his Genesis face or the face of your birth. And so when you look into the mirror of the word, you're supposed to see your new creation face reflected because God is speaking that to you as a child of God. So for the believer to look at, at his Genesis face is to get back into image. That way you begin from the place of victory to victory, glory to glory, faith to faith. You start from the place of the new creation. You don't start from damaged goods trying to fix yourself up. So that's one area. But that's not where we're going. That which surfaced this morning again and again, uh, I want to share this prophetically, clearly, and, and I don't exaggerate when something happens again and again. God has hit Isaiah 22:22, 22, 22, um, probably three to four times today with significant unction on it. So it's not like a coincidence. Isaiah 22:22 22, 22 is, I'm opening a door that no man can shut. I can feel an anointing just saying it. I'm opening a door that no man can shut and that God's basically given opportunities to move to, uh, to advance in the, in the things of the kingdom, to advance in your position of where you're at, we are transitioning. That means also that it will require risk. It will require change for the better. It doesn't mean quit. It means change. And, and that can involve moving from third grade to fourth grade. You'd be surprised how many people in, in, in Christianity that if they get real comfortable in the first grade, they don't want to graduate to the second grade. They would rather be an expert in the first grade than a student in the second grade. That needs to be broken out of us and it's something that I don't ever want to get that comfortable. I don't ever want to get to the place where even some of the people we ran into over the years, my peers and I, traveling from church to church and having pastors uh, that were much more seasoned than I was over the years, always would run into people go, oh yeah, I know that. Oh yeah, I know that. And usually, they were the least informed. So that tells me that be careful what you know because none of us have arrived yet. You know how many times people say, oh yeah, I know that. You've run into people like that. Oh yeah, I already know that and you know they're missing the boat. Isn't that sad? That's, that's just pride. And we need to simply say, I don't know what I know, but I know one thing, that if I walk in the light that I have, God will give me more light. I'm hungry for the more light, not sitting back and content on the light that I have. Um, and so I believe what God is speaking is advancement. And uh, as a matter of fact, Jason even got a, uh, got a key, Isaiah 22, 22 from someone today. Totally out. I mean, it's happening all day long. Isaiah 22, 22, the key of David. And God is basically unlocking and opening doors of opportunity for advancement. But many have, have been gone through, and some still are, but I believe many have gone through a testing. Some will pass, some will fail. Because you know what happens in transition? When it gets uncomfortable long enough, you either persevere or you quit. And so let's pray. Let's pray before we even begin because I don't give up on anybody. I want to pray for the ones who quit. I want the ones that say it's too hard. I've done everything. Nothing's working. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, may the resurrection life and may even the overcoming anointing be imparted from us this day to just uh, reach out in, in loving intercession with the Kratos authority and we release loving intercession in their behalf, but with, uh, with a militant approach to cause them, to strengthen them, to 
pushed back the powers of darkness from around them that they might make free will decisions to turn to God again, to open the door of hope again. And, and all of these things we cannot do for them, but all of these things, I believe many people made bad decisions, many people are gonna make good decisions, but this is the day of an open door. Cross the threshold, be a risk taker. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. So what I believe God is saying in all of this is the Isaiah 54 uh, model. Um, Isaiah 54, there's a promise given. And that promise in Isaiah 54 is for uh, greater... Jennifer, could I have my Bible? Uh, no, I, I, mine's bigger print. <laughs> Mine has all my notations in it that goes. Thank you, sweetie. Um, <clears throat> if you've got your Bibles with you, open to Isaiah 54. And <clears throat> this is the a time to sing O Baron. Like I said, some have felt like they've given up. Some have felt like they've been tested and tried uh, to no avail. But I believe that right now God is saying, I'm about to, I'm about to impose my covenant of peace for whosoever will, will, will come to it. And he's saying, sing, O barren, you who have not borne. Break forth in the singing and cry aloud, you who have not labored with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent. We just did a message on this portion not too long ago about advancing. And I believe God has still given us some principles to advance. Enlarge the place of your tent. Uh, stretch out the curtains. Do not spare. Lengthen. Strengthen. And you shall expand to the right and to the left. Your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate places inhabited. Do not fear. You will not be ashamed. Neither be disgraced. You will be not put to shame. For you will forget the shame of Egypt. And you will not remember the reproach of your widowhood your maker is your husband the lord of hosts is his name and your redeemer is the holy one of israel he is called of god um, and the lord has called you like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit like a youthful wife when you were refused for a mere moment i had forsaken you but with great mercies i will gather you for a, a little wrath i've hid my face from you for a moment but with everlasting kindness i will have mercy on you for this is like the waters of Noah for me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah shall no longer cover the earth, so I have sworn that I would not be angry with you nor rebuke you. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from you. Nor shall, I, nor shall my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord. Afflicted, and, afflicted one, tossed with tempest and not comforted. Behold, I lay your stones in colorful gems, your foundations sapphires. I make your pinnacles rubies, your gates of crystal, and all your walls of precious stones. Your children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. This is going to be the expansion of this covenant of peace where the peace of God is going to go, and you're going to be able to impart it to your natural children, spiritual children, because this kingdom is becoming and moving generationally. We're, we need to think generationally and respond generationally because great shall be the peace of your children. In righteousness you be established. You shall be far from oppression. You shall not fear. Far from terror, for it will not come near you. Indeed, they shall surely assemble, but not because of me. Whoever assembles against you shall fall for your sake. Behold, I've created the blacksmith who blows the coals in the fire, brings forth an instrument for his work. I've created the spoiler to destroy, and no weapon that is formed against you will prosper. Every tongue that rises up against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and the righteousness of me, saith the Lord. Here's the promise given. There's a future of restored. God's calling for greater fruitfulness regardless of the way you view things in the natural or regardless of current situations. Basically, God has given a promise. That's the Isaiah 54 model. He's saying enlargement. This is time to enlargement. When do you prepare for an enlargement? Before anything happens. And wider, longer, higher, and deeper. He's saying the desolate's going to be inhabited. There's going to be a period of reproach that's going to end. Anybody been in a reproach? Anyone feel like everything's against you? It's going to end because the dimensional enlargement is that God is going to cause you to labor internally. There's an internal work being done that is preparation for any enlargement or any expansion. It's an absolute necessity. So 
He's, it's just like it says, my little children for whom I labor and birth again until Christ is formed in you, Galatians 4.19. But God's saying that you might be able to comprehend, take eagerly and possess with all the saints the width, the length, the height, and the depth of the love of God. I believe that in this Isaiah 54 model, God is saying that the preparation is for enlargement, and a new depth of intimacy. And we've said this probably for many years, that the enemy wants to wear out the saints of the Most High God. But God basically says, I want, I want this bride. The height, the width, the length of the love of God, that's a cube. And that cube is the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven. And God's saying, I want inward and outward beauty for this bride. If Isaiah 54, sing, O barren, you have not brought forth, God's going to bring something forth. And he's going to take, he's going to give, remember, um, in Isaiah 60, we were talking about, or 60, um, about beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning. And now I'm saying in Isaiah 54, God's saying there's some things here that I want inner and outer beauty uh, for this advancement. I don't want you just to advance out of works. Um, today at the, uh, uh, the pastor's luncheon, it was interesting, a discussion. Almost everyone that went up uh, that was a pastor was basically saying, oh, uh, they, they had met someone who had great peace and it seemed to be so calm that he had great peace. And someone else says, we need to quit getting into so much works. We need to be able to find out how to practice his presence. Someone else says, we need to do it not just once in a while, but 24-7. <laughs> and not only that, what were some of the other things, Jennifer? It was, um, um, it was, it was just that there was a need to move in the miraculous, but we really need the how-tos. We know what God is telling us to do, but we desperately need the how-tos. Thank you, Stina. Stina was there. Stina kept looking at us going, just give him a book, just give him a book, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but in reality, it's true. That's, uh, the body of Christ is saying that everywhere. They're biblically literate. But now is the time that in order to advance, we need to be able to advance without getting worn out. Because that will be the trap of the enemy. He'll try, he can get you so busy. If a sudden move of God came, people would get so busy they'd be fried. They would have to be able to have the internal strength to know what to do and what not to do, what to say yes to and what to say no to, because that's where the difficulty is. I used to remember in, in, when, the, when the anointing would hit a room corporately, everybody thought they had to talk. That, that comes out of an energy of, oh my goodness, I feel the spirit, that must be me. Of course, you have a room full of preachers, you don't want everybody to talk at the same time. You may never get done. But here's some things that I think we need to understand. I think these things we must understand. One, it is wrong to force enlargement before God calls you into a place of enlargement. That's where I've seen people worn out and burned out. It's wrong to force enlargement before God calls God's fences and his timing versus the enemy's fortifications. That, that's a lot right there when you think about it. The enemies, the enemies has strongholds in various areas, in your mind and in the natural. Uh, and, and the world, he's is under the prince of the power of the air. So he's got his own little systems in play, his worldly systems. And God's got things he's trying to work out in you. And I actually believe that what we oftentimes call limitations, God is calling preparations. <laughs> we, we think that he's fenced us in or that we're unproductive when in reality he's getting the mileage out of what you're doing when it feels like you're doing nothing. And where is your focus when you feel like you're doing nothing? Are you looking to God or are you just wallowing in the fact that I'm doing nothing? And the tendency in that period of testing will make you either push for enlargement prematurely or quit. And 
nothing is something that people fear. They fear nothing. They, they would rather do the wrong thing than nothing. And that has to be overcome. And understand this, that until God said the timing, I learned this the hard way, but I learned it fast. I knew as a baby Christian that God called me to always found a work from scratch. No core group, no nothing. Just start it from scratch, and God would honor it as long as it was him telling me. Well, that was in my DNA, but the very first time I did it, how would you like to do this? I had uh, 20 people in uh, Hubbard, Ohio, and I'm going, that's in my DNA, I'm going to do it. And I got 20 people, and we all held hands in a circle, and we were going to begin. And as soon as I held their hands, God said, I'm not in this. You know what that feels like? I mean, if you're the one that did it. It's, if you're just one in the group, you're going like, Ugh, you know. But what if you're the one that initiated this? Do you know, I never forgot that as long as I live. And when I said I'd never do that again, I've never done that again, ever. Mainly because of, it was a real good object lesson on how not to get ahead of the Lord. Yet it was in my DNA to do that, but it wasn't the timing to do my DNA. And I repented in front of all of them. I'm sure it looked really foolish, and I'm sure it sounded foolish. And then you have even the compassionate people go, no, I'm sure it's okay. And I'm going, I'm, I'm sure I heard from God. He said, I'm not in it. You know, and I let it go. And it was four years, probably four years later, all I knew is that I was submitting to my spiritual father and I was going to make him successful and I wasn't going to let him know the things that I did for him. I was going to do it as unto God. And I did that and it took three pastors to take me out to lunch. Three. One even gave me money. Sandy Colkin gave me money and, uh, and the other two pastors, one came from 20 miles away and says, I know why we're here for this lunch. It's time for Dennis to go into full-time ministry. And as much confirmation as that was, I did the second thing. It's wrong to hold back when God calls. But I was so locked into, I'm never going to do that other thing again. And God told me to submit to this man that when it was time to go do what it was, I didn't even know how to make the transition until it took, it took three people to tell me that it's time before it registered in my head that I need to make that kind of a decision and step into it. I think there's a lot of people right now that I believe that if God tells you that, it's probably going to take a board on the side of the head to get you to do it. But you've got to see it's wrong to try to make something happen, but it's wrong to not move when God's telling you to move. Either way. So those are two things you really need to under, understand. It's both directional revelation and dimensional revelation. God doesn't want you to be disobedient to allowing him to work in you, but he doesn't want you to be disobedient to what he's telling you to do. But the timing really belongs to him. If you honor that timing, you'll be in the right place all the time, all of your life, in the ups and in the downs. And in some of those down times, those are the places where God connects you with the right people, whether you know that they're a resource or not, whether you know they're a divine connection or not, God's going to put these things together. And then in hindsight, you're going to think it was so wonderful. But at the time, it's easy to miss it. We need to understand a third element that wider spheres of influence can be signs of acceptance and approval, meaning fruit. Increased spheres of influence can be fruit or it can be human resourcefulness. I remember one time there was an Asian that came over and he looked at the churches in America and he said, it's amazing what the American church can do without the Holy Spirit. Because all it saw was their resourcefulness. I knew a man that put himself in ministry because he was wealthy. He was wealthy, so he just put himself in ministry. He started a ministry, 
paid all the bills, bragged about how he never took a salary. Well, he was already pretty much wealthy. He didn't have to take a salary and made anybody in ministry that took a salary feel bad. <laughs> you know, so it's like... And the funny thing is, that ministry, it was a television ministry. That television ministry never produced the fruit that his initial anointing did. Isn't that interesting? His initial anointing was he was a CPA. And he had won hundreds of people to the Lord, hundreds, across the desk as a CPA. Just had an anointing to reach the hearts of people. But when he put all his money into this TV ministry, I never recall ever seeing any fruit from it. And so I'm going, so you paid your way into ministry. That'd be like saying, I think I'll go buy a building, start a church, and then do it because I can. So sometimes it can look like it's increasing its sphere of influence, but it can either be the approval of God or human resources. Do you believe man can market? Mm -hmm. So the only thing I knew, one of the things I knew to understand was I will never market myself. I will never promote myself. I will allow God to be the promoter. And when God promotes it, you feel a lot more secure in it. I used to, as a pastor, uh, I used to get letters, and I'm not saying it's totally wrong, but I used to get letters from people who always wanted to come and speak in my church. And I never sent a letter to anybody to speak at anybody's church. I said, if God wants me to speak in people's churches, I'll be invited. And I'm not even 100% sure that that's wrong. I'm just talking about me. But I do know that when, when God put it together, it has a tendency to exalt God a whole lot more when people we went up to New England for $25 a week. And everything we touched turned to gold. I liked it that way better than me knocking on doors and inv inviting myself. And so I think that when it comes to spheres of influence, I think it needs to be real. You can actually expand based on human resourcefulness or it could be the influence of God. Wouldn't you rather have the influence of God accomplishing it rather than human resourcefulness? And uh, you can't say human resourcefulness is not bad. We live in an age where God uses things, whether it's TV or radio or, or any of the, uh, the, the multimedia. But I still think these things need to be understood. It's wrong to force enlargement before God calls. It's wrong not to enlarge when God calls. You could try to be safe. But it's, we need to understand that wider spheres of influence can either be a sign of acceptance of God or, uh, or an approval or fruit, or it can be human resourcefulness. And so, either way, rather than trying to determine that, the thing that should be done is that we need to understand another thing, and that would be that those who enter into an enlarged sphere need to be enlarged within. Because our whole ministry was kind of picking up the pieces because there was something about gifting that had a tendency to get people in trouble. Your gift can get you places that your character can't keep you. And sometimes you can have your gift and be exceptional in your gift but never had the proper character development along the way, get into a high position and come tumbling down very quickly. And so I think one of the things to understand is those who enter into an enlarged sphere need to be enlarged inside first. You agree? They need the maturity on the inside. The promise that God has uh, is actually, from the scripture point of view, is that Isaiah 51, 54, verse 1, he said, In your captivity and your barrenness and in your decreased numbers, sing and worship God, sing songs of deliverance. Because the prospect of opening to the solitary and the desolate 
more children than you had formerly when you enjoyed fellowship in the old Jerusalem. I like that concept. That's basically uh, in your captivity and barrenness and decreased numbers to sing and worship God as if it didn't matter. And one of the ways to cure that, if Isaiah 54 is about the bride, I think it's got to be the love of the Father. The love of the Father, a fatherly anointing over a group of people dies to the numbers games. And when you die to the number games, God can do uh, things that you could never do in and of yourself. And sing because of the prospect opening to the solitary and the desolate. That should be where the passion is, that God places the solitary in families. And the solitaries, if they want to get healed, need to be placed in a family. And they need to enjoy that fellowship and find a dwelling place. But your dwelling place will need enlarging. Longer ropes, larger tent pegs. That's verse 2 in Isaiah 54. Uh, break forth to the right and to the left, all sides. The desolate people will be people. Desolate of people will be people, will become people that are inhabited. I believe that what God's going to do is he's going to get people to go through in advance and, and come into the, into the purposes of Isaiah 54. And if we're going to advance, we're going to have to conquer three U's. This is, we're going to get the finished early today because we're going to hit these three U's. Are you ready for the three U's? What are the three U's? Anybody? You don't know? Good. This is what we're going to conquer. If we're going to advance, we're going to conquer fear. To be a risk taker is basically coming from the place of fear. But thus saith the Lord. This is a prophetic message tonight. These are the three fears that will have to be conquered. The fear of the unknowable. Fear of the I'm running out of paper. Uncontrollable. And three, the fear of the unattainable. I believe that God's got people right now in the place preparing them for advancement. And I said some are flunking, some are passing. Some are making good decisions. Some will just tough it out and say, you know what? If my life is wasted, it's God's life to waste. I'm not my own. I bought with a price. If you take that attitude, you will advance because then you're conquering these. These are the things that are keeping people from moving ahead. The fear of the unknowable. Do you know how many people we've run into that when we go to minister to them, before, you, before they can even die to something, before they can even let God be God, they have to have, but I have to understand. No, you don't. John seven seventeen says, if you will do my will, you shall know. When do you get to know? After you obey. <laughs> so you're going to have to obey what you do know and not demand that you know in advance. You're going to have to obey the last thing that he told you and the last thing. And when you obey what he says, you will know. The knowing comes after the baby step of obedience. Breakthrough is really not something that falls out of the sky, but breakthrough is that which comes when you obey. Anybody have any unknowables in your future? Currently, frustrations? Hmm? It'll come across in your thought life as, why am I here? What am I doing? What's the purpose? Why bother? And I say, in most cases, 
in most cases, there's a demand to understand. Let's pray that right now. If you really want to move forward in God in advance, then what we're going to do is we're going to release that demand to understand. I have to understand before I can obey. No, you need to obey God, and then you will understand. So, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, there's people watching by Ustream, there's a, there's a need to conquer these three U's, these, the unknowable, the unattainable, and the uncontrollable. And right now, I want to deal with the unknowable. There's a whole lot of things in the future that I don't quite understand, but I'm going to to think back on the last thing that God told me to do and I'm going to stand on that and I'm going to hold my heart open to God for love to come through and I'm going to obey and, and risk advancing. I'm preparing even now for greater things. I have nothing to prove it. And again and again and again, prior to advancement, prior to enlargement, there will actually look like a diminishing of returns. It'll actually look bleak. Simple example is, I, I said, as soon as we go to two services, watch, nobody will show up for church. That's t but that's typical. My whole life's been like that. That don't bother me in a bit. I expect that because God is bigger than that. Those are circumstances. Those are people. Haven't you ever done that? God tell you to do something, you step out and do it, and then all the circumstances look like, I don't know if that was such a good idea, when in reality you were supposed to be doing what God told you to do, not analyzing the situation. So Father, in the name of Jesus, I, I release that demand to understand. Strong thinkers, uh, it's good for you to use that mind for the purposes of analysis, but I'll tell you what, that analysis needs to be, I'll tell you what to analyze. Analyze the goodness of God. Analyze the testimonies. Analyze the things that God has done in your behalf. Analyze all of the good testimonies he's given you over the years and how he's shown himself strong on your behalf. And as my mother used to say, this is not scripture, but my mother used to say, it, Dennis, if this is the worst thing you've ever gone through, you're going to have an easy life. Isn't that true? We make mountains out of molehills, and I believe it's time for us to simply say, you know what, this is a time to rise up and let God be God, and, and, and glory in my weaknesses. So, Father, right now, there's some things that I've been wrestling with that I need to understand, and I am relinquishing them back to you, and I don't have to understand. There's some things that you can, you can uh, open with a, with a spirit of revelation and understanding, and there's some things I may never know until I go be with you. And until I'm there, so why wrestle with something when you are the author and the finisher of my faith and I release that demand to understand right now in Jesus' name. I'm prepared to advance and to go in places that I don't know. I'm prepared to take the steps of obedience no matter where they lead me. I am, I am prepared to do what you would tell me to do. I'm prepared to go by a way that I've never gone before. Are you prepared to go by a way you've never, never gone before? I want to release all my former, all former wisdoms, even cumulative wisdom that has come over a period of years that God could teach me a new thing and show me a new way and show me something that I've not known before, for I've not gone this way before, and I'm willing to move forward into that. For this is a season of advancement. This is not a time to quit. This is not a time to go backwards. This is a time to advance. And so, Father, I'm going to take one baby step of obedience today. And I'm going to simply say, I don't have to understand. I'm going to trust you. I'm not leaning on my understanding. I'm going to acknowledge you through divine intimate connection. Through divine intimate connection, and you will direct my path. I just believe that we've all taken a step forward. If you've meant that in your heart, you're going to override some of the, some of the doubts that rise in your heart and some of the demands that, for that intellect to know and think and say, I have to know in advance. In Christ's name, amen. Next area. The fear of the uncontrollable. to overcome that fear that something's out of my control, trust me, the most sanctified, healthy, safest place for it to be is out of your control. 
and be under the lordship of Jesus Christ and under his rule. So, Father, there's some things that, um, um, you know, this, this, this shows up with men, even men that were saying, I trust in God, I trust in God. They lose their job and they fall to pieces. It's easy to trust in God when there's other sources of security. But to get back to where you're trusting in the t security that it's God is my security, whether I'm working or not, God will provide because I am in obedience to him. I'm not waiting for him to just drop provision out of heaven. I'm willing to obey him in whatever way he sees fit. And God basically, when, we did, when I did this, when I worked in the factory and everybody went on strike and the, the office and the plant went on strike, I was actually embarrassed because while we were on strike, I started painting and I made four times the money I made working. <laughs> so it was like, but I just said, God, I'll just do whatever. I didn't sit there and tell him what he had to do. I just did whatever was able to do. Four times the money painting that I made in the office. But it was like, God, I wonder what you're going to do in this season in my life. I yield. I wasn't worried about taking control. I was just going to let it. All of a sudden, people would come up and say, you know what, we're, a couple of us guys are going to get together and we're going to go do painting or we're going to do this. And, but you have to be totally neutral and not your likes and your dislikes sabotage it. So if there's one thing you're going to die to in, in, in releasing control and the fear of something that you can't control is you're going to have to let it go and you're going to have to let your likes and your dislikes go. You've got to be so neutral that you can float on the river of God's will. You can't float real well when you're thrashing about. When you're kicking, screaming <laughs> all the way down, about your lot in life. As long as you're kicking and screaming with your lot in life, you are still in control. So Father, right now, if my life falls apart and it's a wasted life, it's your life to waste. Any fear of control, I receive forgiveness for taking in any fear, any fear of the uncontrollable. You are the ruler of my universe and I receive forgiveness right now for taking in any control. I release my future to simply say, God, as long as you're in control, here am I, send me. I will be obedient to the promptings of your spirit. I will go where you have me go. I will do what you'd have me to do. We are talking about in this matter of control Sometimes God rustles your nest, just like baby birds. You can get comfortable and then get into a false security and you feel like your life is in control, but really you're trusting in all of the comforts that have comforted you. One of the best things you can do for a baby bird is take some of the down out of the nest until they start getting their little backsides pricked into where it's not so comfortable in the nest and then maybe they get out of the nest and maybe they will flap those wings a little bit and become what they were created to become. But that, that uncontrollable fear of what happens when I jump out of the nest what if when I flap those wings, it doesn't keep me up? Yet in reality, without doing that, you never tap into the DNA that causes you to be what you were called to be. So that's with a bird. How much more with us? So let's release any demand to control and manipulating to arrange things for our comfort when in reality we're picking a substitute comfort when God wants to comfort us with himself. Do you think you can do that? Do you think you can sometimes arrange things, control things to, for your comfort that God is saying you are replacing that comfort that I would like to give and you want to control your comfort? You're the one that's putting the nest together. I, I want you to release that demand to control and release it to me. 
Because God says, I'm going to cause some people to advance exceedingly abundantly, but it's going to require risk. And risk doesn't happen when you're, when you're sitting on your comforts and when you're holding on to your comforts. So, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, we're going to release in order to advance. We understand that God is speaking advance. And to move forward and upward, I've got to release my comfort zone. I must quit controlling my surroundings and my comfort. And I release control once and for all. It's almost like a free fall. I'm going to give myself over to you. The last one, the fear of the unattainable. When people are afraid they can't reach something, they either try too hard or quit. The fear of the unattainable is saying, I'll never make it. I'll never be able to do that. Or I'm not the kind of person that, or whatever. I'm believing that what God wants to do is break down that barrier so that he can manifest himself through you to where you can attain the maximum potential that he created you to create. I think it was Rick Joyner that said that Christians really 5% reach their maximum potential. What a terrible statistic. If that would happen, it would be basically because you would not yield to your potential. You yielded to your own opinion of what you could attain. That's a self-imposed limitation. All right? Why don't we just say, I can do all things through Christ, and whatever those all things involve, I'm going to do those things. Because otherwise, I have a view of what my giftings are and what my capacities are, and... Those are the very things that can shackle you because you will base it on your own ingenuity. When God says, no, I have this thing called an anointing that I could cause you to do greater things than you would ever have thought of. But it's really not you. It's the efficacy of the Holy Spirit through you. So, Father, if I have self-imposed limitations, if I think that I could never attain blah, 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 or I could never do this, or I could never do that, I want to die to all those self-imposed limitations that I put on myself. And I mean, it can be anything that you've done to yourself. There's things like I can't sleep at night without a light. There's, <laughs> there's things like I could never speak publicly. There's things like all of that. People experience those kinds of things. God did not give you any of those those were imposed either by you or by other people. And there's reasons. I don't, like in church, they would say, I can't do children. I can't do children. Well, God's in the children business, so <laughs> you better get used to it because there are, we're all God's children. If you can't do little children, you probably can't do big children. We're all the same. So, Father, right now, I just release, I just release any potential uh, that is standing in the way any bias that I have, any demand that, I, that I'm afraid that I just can only go so far. How many were raised in church to where if you messed up, you settle for the law of diminishing returns anyway? Some were. Some would simply say they were taught that basically, well, yeah, you messed up, so therefore you can only amount to so much in the church or you can't be... You know, sometimes it's, and then they will use the argument like, well, we don't want to lower the standard. And I'm saying, actually raise the standard. Raise it. Jesus said, he didn't say adultery was the standard. He said, if a man even less than his heart has committed adultery. I think some of those same people that are using a standard ought to raise the standard and make it higher. Make it spiritual to where you need Jesus and not some outward performance. Raise it to the place where the only way it, that it is unattainable except through Christ. And so, Father, we just thank you right now that in the days ahead that as we advance, we're going to conquer this spirit of fear. And we receive forgiveness for taking in a fear that something's not attainable in our life. That there's something we can't do because we can do all things through Christ. Anything that Christ initiates in me, I could do. How many can think of stuff that you don't think you can do? You're basing, it, you're basing it on past performance, right? Well, what if God wanted to do a new thing in advance? 
Are you willing to die to that limitation? That's all God's asking. Because I don't know what he's going to call us to do. But can you die to any limitation that you put on yourself? There's a whole lot of things that if God said, Dennis, do this, Dennis, do that, Dennis, I'd go, whoa, I never did that before. <laughs> but would I, would I be willing? Absolutely. Because that word on the top, fear, God didn't give any one of us. And if we're going to advance, if God's going to be doing in the church what I believe he's going to do in preparing a bride, that's got to go in every way, shape, or form. We, we're not going to make progress or advance with fear. So we need to just receive forgiveness for taking in fear in any form, something that God never gave us, and open our hearts to the things that God has for us in the future. Can anybody give me some examples of some things that you said you can't do? I'm going to turn them around. I can't think of a zillion examples, so give me some. Jennifer, what couldn't you do? Jennifer said she can't write. And what did she do? She overcame that. Actually, Jim Gall laid hands on her and said, many people have wanted me to impart this. I feel led to pray for you, Jennifer. And then she started writing like crazy ever since. She hasn't stopped yet. Day and night, she's behind the computer. We've got probably three e-books, probably going to do five before long on our material. And when we did our first manual, it took us forever to get that first manual. It was hard. Now they just pop out. It's like popcorn. And then, aren't you glad she didn't say, I can't? Same thing Jennifer said when we first got married. I can't do public speaking. Now she steals my microphone. Now she puts her, huh? She did that at the module. She took 15 minutes. That was mine. But I, I dropped down. I released forgiveness to her because she was on a roll. Anybody else? I want to see this stuff broken. What do, you, what do you, name some fears because if we don't up, admit them honestly. I have the control thing all the time in the classroom. The kids take control of the lesson. You know? mm -hmm. And there's a real fear there that I'll be seen as a poor teacher if they take control of the class. Uh, let's break that fear. Because God gave you, let's first let's receive forgiveness for taking that in. The fear that I'll be seen as a weak teacher if the children take control of the class. I receive forgiveness for taking that fear in. And now I'm going to advance. Because you did that fast. I'm going to advance in obedience by the grace of God to move with Kratos dominion in my jurisdiction. So who's in control now? Christ is in control. If he sent you as a teacher into a jurisdiction, I don't care if you got the most unruly <coughs> children in the world, if he sent you there, you are going there with a dominion authority and you don't have to exercise that authority or try to get that authority you have that authority and that and that will rule and your yes is yes and your no is no and you will actually move in greater effective authority in your timing in your yeses and your nos when the fear's not ruling because fear will bring it to pass and they will get out of control they will feel the fear and they will they'll push They'll push back. Very good. Anyone else? Something like that. Mom, we would be strong. Do you see the difference in that illustration of, of how to literally advance in a tangible way? Is to walk in that classroom and say, this is my jurisdiction. God sent me here. This is my mission field. And thereby I have a responsibility to, to have dominion 
and my dominion is the lordship of Jesus Christ who sent me here. And you have that same thing on your job. And to give in to the fear of the people around you, whether it's co-workers or anything, is literally, is literally sacrificing what God has given you. What's that? Way down on the floor. that now I feel like I'm too old to start a business. Oh, good. Oh, and, That's or, a good one. Let's know. pray that one through. God may be putting it on her heart to start a business, and the first thing is I'm too old. That's one of the oldest tricks in the book. <laughs> too old. I went into deep depression at age 19 because I joined the reserves, and in the army I would be out when I was 25. I went into a deep depression thinking about someday I'll be 25 years old. So you could say too old the rest of your life. You'll always be too old. All right, let's receive forgiveness for putting age limits on anything. Except bearing children. I don't want any more children, so don't pray for no <laughs> blessings for me like that. All things are possible with God. I'm getting scared now a little bit. I'm going <laughs> to have to practice what I preach now. Okay. I pray, Father, remove the barrier of age because our God is on the outside of that box called time. He lives in eternal time, and his time's not the same as our time. And so, Father, I yield and surrender time to God. And I receive forgiveness for taking in that I'm too old. I renounce that lie. What I really need to know is what God is saying. Therefore, I renounce that lie that I'm too old to be a, a self-imposed limitation on what is attainable. We thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. Are we going to attack these in the days ahead? One, two, three. When we enter into the new promised land that God is giving us, there's no security with the old place. Right? They have a question on you, Stream? Go ahead. Okay, what are they afraid of? Um, yes, a lot. A fear of not being able to get into a good college. It's from a senior in high school right now. Uh -huh. All right. If God's steps are ordered of the Lord, your confidence should be that you want to please God in, in furthering your education and you want to be in the place that God wants you to be. The limitation there is more telling God what kind of school. And you may have to surrender your preferences for the place of being obedient. And I'm talking from experience because I battled with the Lord that I wanted to go to a certain school and he told me I'm going to send you to the school of the Spirit and I was upset. But when I died to that and said, I, then show me this school of the Spirit then and everything we're teaching to this day that I would say was successful or fruitful in the kingdom was as a result of obedience to that and not doing it my way. So I don't know if that'll help or not, but you do have to relinquish your preferences. Your, prefer your likes and your dislikes can get in the way of God's best because we really don't know what God's best is. At that time, I did not think the school of the Spirit, me and God, was better than going to school. But I like that part the best. I sat in the early years unschooled 
with uh, a seminary graduate and a Greek scholar, and they would sit there and they recognized that God was speaking to me as a young Christian, and this seminary graduate, seasoned missionary, and a Greek scholar, both of them much uh, older than I was, much more seasoned, they would read something the way they were taught in seminary and then take it to me and say, Dennis, how do you see this? And I say, who's he talking to? And I say, well, he's talking to the church in this situation. And I think this means that. And they're going, we both are beginning to think the same thing. So don't underestimate what God can teach you by the Spirit. Don't ever underestimate. These were brilliant men, good men, seasoned men. But basically what I was taking for granted, what God had taught me in the school of spirit. So don't, don't look at the name or the label on a school. Look to be in the right place at the right time and be where God wants you to be will ultimately fulfill your destiny. So release forgiveness for taking in the fear because there's still a matter of control there based on preference. You say, whichever one God picks for me is the best school. Okay. Are we done? <laughs> There's no more questions. All right, let's just pray. Father, in the days ahead, we're in a season of advancement. Let's look for those who are falling by the wayside and encourage them to get up, face their pain, brush themselves off and move forward. And for the rest of us, let's look at self-imposed limitations and saying these are just mere molehills that we're going to overcome. We're going to start speaking to mountains and say, be thou removed. I believe there are many, many people in transition that where God wants you to enlarge the place of your tent, he wants you to advance, but there's, there's these self-imposed limitations and barriers, these basic fears that are standing in the way and say, we're going to serve notice on fear, that we're not afraid of the unknowable, the uncontrollable, or the unattainable. We're we're going to move and conquer out of obedience to God, and we're going to take baby steps of obedience, but we're going to crush the works of the enemy. And God never gave me a spirit of fear. I'm certainly not taking it in now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.